morning we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I kind of realize that I may be beating a dead horse here, but not really because, you know, this is the world that we live in. And I started out this sermon uh, preaching another way, but this is the way that I believe that the Spirit led me to, to preach it this morning. And I think it's exactly what the Bible is teaching us about the, you know, the last days and the days that we're living in. I believe we're in the last times. I mean, uh, you know, Jesus could come back a thousand years from now, but we're still in the last times. And the Bible warns us about the last times and what it's going to be like. And that's what we're living in today. But if you guys are there, 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse number one, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us such a beautiful day today. Thank you for getting us here, Lord, and uh, bringing us all together into your house, uh, the church house, uh, where we come to congregate uh, together to worship you and to glorify you, to sing praises unto you and to learn your word, and to be with each other. Thank you for all your blessings that you bless us with each and every day. I pray that you be with us today, Lord, and open up our hearts and minds to take, into your word, take in your word into our hearts and in our minds and apply it to our lives and to acknowledge that you're warning us of the times to come and how bad things may get. And how we just need to stay steadfast in your word and uh, live as you want us to live as Christians, uh, glorifying you in everything that we do, 
uh, you know, in this world until we meet you in the air. So we just pray that you be with each and every one of us. I pray that you be with me and help me preach your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of my message is Virtue. Uh, virtue is only mentioned a few times in the Bible, and it's mentioned three times here in uh, the book of Second uh, Peter chapter 1. If you would look down at verse number 5. It says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. What is virtue? If you look it up in the dictionary, it just basically says a high moral standard. The synonyms are goodness, righteousness, character, you know, godliness. High moral standards are pretty hard to come by these days in the world. It's pretty hard to come by. Nobody has high moral standards anymore. Nobody. Not even the people in the church, you know, they have low standards. What would I call high moral standards? You know, I would call high moral standards, you know, uh, dressing like you got some sense. You know, how do people dress today? You know, it's, people are out in their pajamas, you know, going to work and going grocery shopping. Uh, uh, you know, dressing like idiots, for lack of a better term. You know, people should dress like they have respect for themselves. You know, if you watch old movies and stuff like that, how do people dress? You know, it's with respect for themselves. If you look at old pictures, you know, of old times, you don't see people on the street Wearing their pajamas. Uh, you don't see people walking down the street, you know, with their pants halfway down their buttocks. You know, that's a disgrace. That's disrespecting to everybody around you and, and to yourself. Who wants to see that? You know, pull your pants up. You know, and don't show the world your body parts. You know, we used to have high moral standards in this country, you know. Just like I was saying, you know, you, you could look at old pictures, old movies and stuff. You wouldn't see women running around in their underwear or in tights. You may see that in some place somewhere, but you're not going to see that out on the street. That's all we see today. You know, I can stand up here while I'm preaching and see people walk by the window there. You know, wearing tights, showing the whole world all their body parts. You know, that, that should be, uh, you know, for you by yourself and your spouse, not for the rest of the world. You know, that just goes to show you what kind of men are hanging around these women that, you know, dress in tights going around in the streets. What kind of man would allow their woman to do that? I know I wouldn't. Uh, you know, I'd be throwing them in the garbage. And if they like it, they could stay home. Uh, you know, we have to have high moral standards, especially as Christians. How about the way we talk? You know, how do people talk to you when they, when you call them on the, when they call you on the telephone? You know, I, I do a lot of business with people I don't know, and they'll call me, and they'll start cussing and stuff, and I hang up on them. You know, they may call me back, uh, uh, and, you know, I just go on and talk to them. I don't give them no excuse. When people start cussing to me on the phone, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear that filth coming out of their mouth. I just hang up on them. You know, you go into the gas station or a restaurant, and people, you know, they just talk to you like, you know, it doesn't mean anything. Every cuss word under the sun. No moral standards anymore. And, you know, you talk to the younger generation, they're used to texting, and they'll start talking to you in, in ways that you don't even understand because you can't understand the language of the kids sometimes today. You know, they abbreviate everything, you know, like, like the word sus. You know, it doesn't make any sense. If somebody said that to me, I mean, what are you talking about? You know, that's just short for suspicious. You know, but I wouldn't know that until somebody explained it to me. You know, that's how people have no moral standards today. They talk to you any way that they... They want to, and they think you're going to understand or accept the way that they talk. You know, I don't want to hear a bunch of foul language. And, you know, that really burns me up when people start talking to me. It's, uh, you know, people you don't know, they, they expect that you're going to be okay with their foul mouth. You know, do they pray with that same mouth? Do they talk to their mama with that same mouth? No, they don't. You know, there's no standards in the world today. How about the way that we allow ourselves what we allow ourselves to hear and see on the TV and radio. Do we have any standards? You know, when we turn on the TV, you know, I'm quick to turn it off. You know, the first time I hear a cuss word on TV, I just turn it off. I don't watch TV, but others in my house do. When I hear a cuss word, I turn it off or make them change the channel. 
You know, because I have standards. And we as Christians should have standards. We should never allow that stuff to come into our ears. You know, when Gracine was uh, first learning how to talk, uh, she said a few cuss words. She didn't get them from me. She got them from somebody else. Uh, that's because nobody has any standards. They're willing to talk in front of a child, you know, with cuss words. And people just repeat what they hear. They let it slip out. Because it's embedded in their mind. Once you hear that stuff, it gets embedded into your mind. You can't get rid of it. It's there forever. You know, it's just like sin, you know. Sin will always show herself in the end. You know, when we allow that stuff to come into our mind, eventually it will come out. Uh, but we have to have high moral standards. Some virtue. He says, add unto your faith virtue. That means when you get saved, add virtue. Be a different person. High, you need to have high moral standards. God said, be ye holy for I am holy. That means to have high moral standards. To have virtue. You know, that's what the definition of virtue is. High moral standards. You know, set apart from the world. Be ye holy for I am holy. Have virtue. If you would, look at verse number 4. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When we get saved, we should have that divine nature. That's the same thing of saying we should have virtue. Because we have escaped the corruption that is in the world. You know, the rest of the world can do whatever. But when they try to bring that unto us, you know, we need to nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud as Christians because we will not accept it. We will not accept their low standards, especially as Christians. Because we have virtue, high moral standards. We are to partakers of the divine nature. Then our standards must be high. Higher than the world's standards. There is no virtue in the world, especially today. It's getting worse and worse, but there's never really been virtue in the world. The church is supposed to be leading the world. In our morals, in our character, in our standards... That's what the church is supposed to do. You know, that's what the children of Israel was supposed to do. They were supposed to lead the world in high standards so the rest of the world can follow. That's what the church is supposed to be doing today is leading the world with standards. You know, they may hate us. They may look down on us. But they have respect uh, to our standards. And we're supposed to be leading the world. If you would look at verse number 3, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. <coughs> we are supposed to be leading the world as Christians <coughs> with glory and virtue. Glory to God and virtue in our lives. Showing the rest of the world what it means uh, to be a Christian, to be somebody who follows God, who believes in God. What is virtue today? As far as the world goes, virtue is acceptance and tolerance. Acceptance and tolerance. That's what they believe virtue is. Live and let live. You know, if it feels good, do it. Uh, that's what virtue is. There is no high standards. Their high standards is if, you, if, if it feels good, do it. If it makes you happy, do it. It doesn't matter what you have to do or what you're doing as long as it makes you happy. You know, the term live and let live. You know, that's where it all began. Live and let live. Okay, I'll live this way. You live however you want. Uh, that's your choice. That's not what the Bible teaches. You know, we're supposed to be leading the world in virtue. Live and let live is all good until some 40-year-old pervert wants to go in the same bathroom with the 12-year-old daughter. You know, live and let live until that happens. You know, people are saying live and let live and then, you know, girls are getting molested in locker rooms in schools. And then their parents speak up. You know, the year before they was probably saying live and let live. You know, we need to have higher moral standards and not put up with the filth that's going on in the world today. You know, if it ain't bothering me, why does it matter? 
You know, that's the attitude that the world has today. If it ain't bothering me, why does it matter? Live and let live. Do whatever you want to. That's not the way we're supposed to live as Christians. We're supposed to set an example. We're supposed to be telling other people, hey, that's wrong. We're not going to accept it. Our standards are too high. But our standards are not too high. They're low. They're low in the world. I've said this before, but we've all seen, you know, the bumper stickers that say coexist. Pretty soon they're going to have bumper stickers that say coexist, and they're going to have that LGBTQ on the, on the part of it, at the end of it. You know, acceptance, tolerance. The world is tolerating the low virtue or the non-existent virtue of the world today. The church is accepting it. The world is accepting it. Why is there so much tolerance today? Because nobody is speaking up. They're all saying live and let live. Coexist. That's why there is so much tolerance today. We're letting everything slip by us. You know, who cares as long as they do it. I'm not going to do it, but, you know, live and let live. This all started, I believe, with Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, judge not. You know, they don't know the rest of that verse. All they know is judge not. You know, and some people say that that's the most famous verse in the Bible right now. It even exceeds John 3.16. You know, because everybody is saying, judge not. You need to tolerate me. You need to accept me. And if you don't, I'm going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. You know, everybody who preaches this is getting kicked off YouTube. Everybody that's preaching this is having uh, protesters out in front of their church. Uh, you know, tolerance and acceptance. We don't have to be accepting. We don't have to tolerate it. Especially not as Christians. No one is speaking up. The ones that are are getting persecuted. The Bible says, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What are they doing? They're just preaching the truth. If we don't judge, what is high moral standards? What is virtue? If we don't judge, how do we know what is virtue? We don't because it's live and let live. Oh, it's okay what he's doing. That makes him happy. Let him do it. Well, then we don't know what virtue is. This right here says, add to your faith virtue. Add to your salvation vir virtue. For by grace are you saved through faith. You know, so when we get saved, we need to have virtue. High moral standards. You know, the church today is saying judge not. The world is saying judge not. Does God want us to judge? John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. God, Jesus himself is commanding us to judge, to make judgments, righteous judgments. You know, don't just look at somebody and say, well, that person's unsaved, or that person's wicked, or that person is this or that. You know, let their character, which is a part of virtue, determine how you judge that person. You know, I've heard personally so many times in churches... I know we're not supposed to judge, but, you know, those people ain't coming to church on Sunday. Well, that's a judgment. They should be coming to church on Sunday. You know, what Jesus is saying there, you know, don't condemn somebody for not coming to church if you're not coming to church. If you're coming to church and your friend is not, then you can say, hey, you're not coming to church. You need to come to church. That's righteous judgment. In Psalm 33, verse 4, it says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. It says that God loves judgment right there. You know, but they want to say, judge not, judge not. In Psalm 37, verse 28, it says, For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. You know, how do we know virtue unless we make judgments? In both of those verses, it says, The Lord loveth judgment. And Isaiah 61, verse 8, it says, For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. It says, I love judgment. You know, us as Christians, we need to make judgments so we can have high moral standards. Is that wrong? Is that right? You know, that, was, that is what's virtue. High moral standards. We need to keep our standards as high as God wants us to he said, for, he said, be ye holy, for I am holy. In Amos chapter 5, verse 10, it says, They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Judge not, judge not. That's because they hate it when you tell them that what they're doing is wrong, 
And that is unholy, and that's not what God wants for us in this world, whether you're saved or not. You know, God wants us to act a certain way, and when we don't, we need to speak up. And it says it right there that they hate him that rebuketh in the gate. The gate is where they went and made all their judgments. Uh, in the Old Testament, they sat at the gate. And when somebody had a problem, they would come to the gate for judgment. They hate them that rebuketh in the gate. They hate it when they tell them what they're doing is wrong. They abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Judge not. Judge not. That's what the world is saying. Judge not. In Amos chapter 5 verse 15 it says, Hate the evil and love the good. How do you know what's evil and what's good unless you make a, some kind of moral judgment? Moral character. High moral standards. Hate the evil and love the good. Establish judgment in the gate. That it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. How do we know what's evil and what's good unless we make a judgment call with our high moral standards? And Amos chapter 5 verse 24 says, But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. You know, all these verses are from God for us to make judgments, to determine what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. What we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 it says, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And in all judgment. You know, over and over again, the Bible is telling us to make righteous judgments. Judge not. Judge not. In Zechariah chapter 8 verse 16 it says, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. You know, it's the same thing. You know, execute judgment. You know, if somebody's doing something wrong, it's our job as Christians to tell them what they're doing is wrong. You know, people don't want us to speak up. The church doesn't want to speak up. You know, they don't want to say, you know, that's wrong. Uh, you can't be doing this. You can't be doing that. Judge not. God loves judgment. And it's us as Christians that's supposed to be leading the way for the rest of the world. You know, in your gates, at, at, at your judgment. You know, that includes your family, your friends, you know, the ones that start cussing to you when you don't even know them. And Hey, you know, why the potty mouth? You're going to talk to me like that way? You know, if you let them know you're a Christian, will they stop talking to you like that? You know, uh, you know just the other day, I, I think I was, I was talking to somebody, I can't remember who, it might have been a customer. Every other mouth, every other word out of their mouth was a cuss word. And, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, uh, you know, do you pray to God with that same mouth? You know, and they don't even realize that they're doing it because their standards are gone. They have no more virtue, you know. It's, it's, it's like it ain't nothing to them. You know, but to me it is. It burns my ears, especially when I hear it on TV in my own house. And I just turn the TV off and, uh, you know, they may not like it, but that's the way it is. You know, we don't need to hear that stuff. We need to have high standards in our lives as Christians. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You know, where it says profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction, that includes unsafe people that are in our lives, that are in our face, you know, with their potty mouth, or they're not dressed properly. You know, it's us to reprove them for those things, uh, to let them know what God wants for them. And it's also a good way to, to get the conversation started. Uh, to give them the gospel. If you would, look over at 1 Peter chapter 4. For In my Bible, it's on the same page. In your Bible, it might be one page back. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. It says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved... Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Notice how it says the judgment must begin at the house of God. And then it mentions the gospel. You know, that's a great time to give somebody the gospel. You know, when you're telling them they need to quit speaking like they got a potty mouth. But the judgment must begin 
at the house of God. That's us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. High moral standards. Instead of Christians having virtue today, high moral standards, they have acceptance and a tolerance. That's why our world is getting so wicked, because we're supposed to be leading the way in what's good and what's bad, and we're not. We're failing as Christians. You know, most Christians, I believe, are not saved today. Uh, you know, the ones that are saying, you know, judge not, live and let live. How can they be saved? You know, after reading the Bible, be ye holy for I am holy. We're supposed to be speaking up as Christians to the world, you know, but most Christians today are acceptance and tolerance. That's what their church is all about. Everybody's welcome. Everybody's not welcome in this church. You know, sinners are welcome in this church, but there's some that are not welcome because we have kids to protect. Uh, we have our high moral standards to uphold while we're in God's house especially. But instead of most Christians having virtue today, all they have is acceptance and tolerance. Everybody's welcome. Proverbs, after, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 5, it says, It is not good to accept the person of the wicked, to overthrow the righteous in judgment. It's not good to accept these people and, you know, their filth, especially in God's house. We should not accept them. That should be below our standards. We should have a standard that we will not uh, lower ourselves to a lower standard. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, I hear all the time pastors saying that we need to reach these people. And you know what I mean by these people? They're the ones that are hating God, doing all this wickedness in the world today. That is true. I believe that. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The key word is go. There's no verse in the Bible that says build a church house and invite all the wickedness into the church. We should be a safe haven, especially for everyone in here who has a high moral standard. Their idea is to bring them into the church house. That's what they do. Everybody's welcome. Church is supposed to be safe, especially for children. Some people are not allowed in church. That's just a fact. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5... You're going to chapter 6, but I'll start in chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, it says, I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Some people are just not allowed in church. That's what that's saying there. Get them out of the church because our standards are high. They are unholy. In verse number 10 it said, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. That means that we would have to leave the world to get rid of those. You know, when we're out in the world, we can evangelize to these people, but we don't bring them into the church. You know, and that's where the church is lacking today. They're not going out into the world and preaching the gospel. They're just saying, everybody's welcome. Come on in. It doesn't matter who you are. You know, there's a, a Christian pastor who wrote a book a few years ago that's saying we need to fill the church with homosexuals because they make good children's workers. He wrote a book about that. He called them eunuchs in the Bible. Oh, those are just eunuchs. They make good children's workers. What kind of filthy uh, person would uh, subject their kids to that kind of thing? It's the same thing they're doing today with all these drag queen shows. Trying to subject our children to this filthiness, trying to conform their mind to this world. When the Bible says, uh, conform your mind to God. Live, be ye holy, for I am holy. 
That's what they're trying to do today, even in the churches. You know, make no mistake, uh, if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to read verses 1 through 11, it says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Notice what that says there in verse number 4. Least esteemed in the church. You know, the lowest people in the church should be at least able to judge, you know, what's wicked and what's not. But they say, judge not. You know, judge not. Let everybody in. Everybody's welcome. It says, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you. Because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take the wrong? Take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong, and defraud, and that your brethren. Knowing, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulteresses, I'm sorry, nor idolaters or adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, those are a lot of things right there in that list that's also not allowed in the church. Because he says, such were some of you. They're not in the church now. And make no mistake about it, uh, effeminate does not mean a homo. It just means a girly man. You know, I used to uh, uh, work at a home center part-time, and every Saturday, all the men would get together and wear a pink shirt. And they came up to me one day and asked me why I never wore a pink shirt on Saturdays. It was a Saturday thing. Uh, I said, because I don't wear girly clothes. And they said, well, you need to get in touch with your feminine side. You know, that's effeminate. There's no effeminate in me whatsoever. I'm 100% man. God is 100% man. Behold the man, Christ Jesus. You know, that's just a, a stepping stone to what's going on in the world today. You know, men want to get in touch with their feminine side. They want to be a girly man. You know, there's nothing worse than turning on a, uh, a church service and seeing the pastor up there in a pink shirt. Uh, you know, looking like a girly man. You know, men should dress as men. Like men. There's no feminine side to any man and there's no masculine side to any woman. If there is, there's something majorly wrong. You know, men are supposed to be men. Women are supposed to be women. In the beginning, God made them male and female. Mark chapter 10. <laughs> Effeminate does not mean a homo. It just means a girly man. In Romans chapter 1 verse 24 says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forevermore. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly. That means it's disgusting to look at. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, effeminate, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. That's a pretty big list. People want to say, well, they make good children's workers. Really? 
You go through that list and that sounds like somebody who works well with children. No, that's a recruiter is what that is. Somebody who's fake, giving a false front, but really they're haters of God, uh, despisers of good things, implacable, unmerciful. You want somebody who's unmerciful to be watching your children in the daycare center at church? No, church is supposed to be a safe haven, especially for uh, children. Jesus himself said it'd be better for a millstone to be hanged around their neck and, and dumped into the sea uh, you know, than to hurt one of these little ones. I'm paraphrasing there. Jesus said it'd be better for a millstone, better for them not even to be born than to hurt a little uh, a child. But yeah, let's put, them, let's put them in the daycare with all of our little children. That sounds like a good idea. To finish that out, it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death. Yeah, somebody who's worthy of death, we should put in charge of our children. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Tolerance. Our virtue today in the world is tolerance. Live and let live. Well, by, the Bible says right there that, you know, they're worthy of death too if they're going to be tolerant of that filth that's in our world today. And that's what's being shoved down our throat. Tolerant. Worthy of death. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verse 20, it says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That means to have virtue, a high moral standard. We need to have virtue, a standard to live up to. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 28, it said, I'm sorry, in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. You know, pretty soon they're going to be doing that. Defile not yourselves in any of these things. For in all these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. You know, why did God have the children of Israel go through these nations and destroy them and wipe them out? Because they're doing the same things that they're doing today in our our nation today, in the world today. It says, And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you, we got lots of strangers around us today that's doing all this wicked stuff. And is, the Bible says that the nation's going to spew them out. You know, what God is saying there is he's highly upset about what's going on. It's the same thing today. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 29, it says, For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. But hey, let's bring them into the church. Let's invite them into the church house because we need to reach those people. That's because they're too lazy to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, they just want to come and stand in front of a pulpit and, and, and say, Jesus loves you no matter how you are. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Jesus loves you. Uh, live and let live. You know, tolerance and acceptance is wickedness. That is all wickedness. And that's what we have in the church today and in the world. Wickedness because they accept the low standards of no moral values. In Leviticus chapter 20, 13, it says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon him. Now that's hate speech. And I agree with that. That is hate speech. I hate those people. We should hate those people because the Bible said, when we was back in Amos, love the good and hate the evil. Because that's evil. How do we know it's evil? Romans chapter 1. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, bike batters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. That is evil. That's the list of evil. If you want to describe evil, just read Romans chapter 1. That's evil. Love the evil, hate the good. Like it says in Amos chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5, it says, 
The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Amen. But hey, let's send our kids to some drag queen show where some uh, overweight male with a beard is dressed up like some uh, freaky looking clown girl and let, her, uh, let him uh, tell our kids stories. Hey, well, let's just leave them there and, 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 and go and come back later on and, and see if our kids are okay. You know, that's, you'd have to have your uh, mind in the gutter to drop your kids off at a, something like that. But what's even worse is when they creep into the church uh, watching the kids and you just drop your kids off at some daycare. We will never have a daycare at this church. You know, even if all these pews were full and we had 100 kids here, we would never have a daycare where we put them apart in a closed room with somebody that they don't know. You can always do a background check, but you can't do a forward check. There's always the first time you know, we need to protect our kids. You know, but what are they doing today? They're giving their kids uh, to these evil people who hate God and say, hey, these people are good. They're good children's workers. That's a lie, and that's from Satan. It says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. You know, what is this today? You know, a lot of times when you're walking behind a couple, you can't tell which is which. You know, that's the whole point of this story is a man should be a man and a woman should be a woman. What do we have in the world today? Just look at Bud Light, Tractor Supply. Uh, you know, those are, uh, Bud Light's a wicked place anyways. I wouldn't have nothing to do with them. But, you know, the whole country is boycotting Bud Light because uh, of what they're doing. You know, they're putting some homo on their cans. Tractor Supply is doing the same thing. You know, they're promoting drag queen shows. And that's wickedness. They're trying to corrupt the mind of our youth to make us weaker. Weaker as a nation. In Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 17 it says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. We all know what a sodomite is. They came, you know, that's a term that came from Sodom. God never gave them warning. He just destroyed them. You know, Lot was there the whole time being vexed with the filthy communication of what was going on there. And he just destroyed them. And, you know, by the grace of God, he got Lot out. Uh, but he never gave them warning. He just burned them all up because of the wickedness that was going on there. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 18, it says, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both of these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. But what do we do? Everybody's welcome. They make great children's workers. You know, let's bring them all into the house of God instead of going out and evangelizing. You know, when I am soul winning and I come to a house that's got a, a big pride flag, a big rainbow flag in their yard, I still knock on the door. Because there may be somebody in there that's uh, able to get saved. You know, there may be somebody there that's going to slam the door in my face or cuss me out. There may be somebody in there that's going to get saved. And not all these people are uh, reprobate yet. You know, it's the ones that burn in their lust one toward another, I believe, that are reprobate. They're too far gone. So I go ahead and knock on their doors anyways because the Bible says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job as Christians to preach the gospel to every creature. You know, let God sort them out if they're unsavable or not. But don't bring them into the church house. Don't let them around your kids because they're recruiters. Uh, you know, they can't get together and reproduce. All they can do is recruit, and that's their goal. They sung that song last year out in California, said, we're coming after your kids. You know, that was a sodomite singing that song. We're coming after your kids. And people are like, well, live and let live. You know, if, as long as it's not bothering me, everything's okay until... Uh, you know, you have a 12-year-old daughter and she gets, you know, molested by one of these freaks, you know, in some public restroom or a, a locker room somewhere. I thought it was live and let live. Well, it's okay until that happens. You know, no, speak up before that happens. You know, just like somebody who passes away and you never gave them the gospel, and then you look back and say, I wish I would have given them the gospel. No, do it now. You know, if we're going to have high moral standards, let's speak up now, not after the fact. You know... Like I said, you, you can do a background check, but you can't do a forward check. Speak up now. 
We are commanded to reprove the world and let them know what the high standards need to be. The world is going to get worse and worse. We can't do nothing about that because that's just the way it's laid out in the Bible. We can't fight against God. But we can have high moral standards ourselves, especially in God's house. In 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 22, it says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. You know, what were they doing when God went through there? You know, we, say, we read the Bible and say, why would God kill all these people? That's why, because they're doing the same things back then that they're trying to do today. The filth of their world, they have no standards. Doing everything. He says, uh, he cast them out before the children of Israel because of all their abominations. Not everything is abomination to God. You know, when we tell a light lie, you know, that's a sin. It's not abomination. That's forgivable. You know, a lot of things are abomination to God. And I read some of those things earlier. Uh, you know, a drag queen is an abomination to God. Uh, two men together is an abomination to God. Two women together is an abomination to God. He cast out all those nations before Israel. That's tolerance. You know, he said, cast out before the children of Israel. That means don't bring them into your churches. Don't bring them into your homes. Don't bring them into your nation. Cast them out. In 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 1, the very next chapter, it says, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and did as his father David, and did as did, father, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He got rid of all the Sodomites. Imagine if we did that today. You know, it's only about, what, 5% of the population? How hard would it be to get rid of them? You know, our country would be a lot better off. Especially those are ones that are trying to get around our kids. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 22, verse 46, it says, And the remnant of the Sodomites which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. You know, imagine if we did that today. In 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 7, it says, And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. You know, all the ones that were around the church, he got rid of. He tore down their houses. They had no place to live. They had to leave. The new modern versions, you know, changed the word Sodomite to uh, male, sh male shrine prostitutes. You know why? Because they're tolerant. They're accepting homosexuals in the churches. They don't want to offend nobody. Everybody's welcome. God loves you no matter what. So they change that into a male shrine prostitute. What, what the heck is that? There's no such thing. They made that up. You know, that's not anywhere. Uh, you know, that's just ridiculousness. You know, they change the word sodomite to male shrine prostitutes because they don't want to offend them because they are lovers of them. Like it says in Romans chapter 1, not only which do the same, uh, but have pleasure in them that do them, tolerant. It says they're worthy of death. They're worthy of death. If you accept that lifestyle, you're worthy of death is what the Bible says. Tolerance. This is Pride Month, and I didn't want to wait till everybody else has preached on this before I did. Uh, but like I said, I didn't start out to preach this, but the, the, the Holy Ghost led me to preach it. Uh, if you would go to the book of Jude. This is Pride Month. You know, it's abomination. This stuff is going to be shoved down our throat. I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but here in a little while, it's going to be shoved down our throat. We're going to see it going down our streets. The wickedness. And, and a lot of these churches say we need to reach these people. And, you know, some of these people will go out and start barking at these uh, uh, parades and stuff like that. The Bible says keep yourself from all appearance of evil. There's no reason to go out there and start barking at these people. You're just wasting your time. If you want to spend your time, go knock on somebody's door and give them the gospel because they're not going to accept it. They're implacable. As that list in Romans chapter 1 says, 
In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 48, it says, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done. Thou and thy daughters, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Isn't that what they have today? Pride, abundance of idleness, full of bread. They have everything they need. They're getting everything they want, and it's not enough because they're implacable. But that's why they're doing this stuff today, because they can get away with it, because everybody's tolerant. That's why they have pride and fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. It says, Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sister in all thine abominations which thou hast done. Thou also which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed, more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame, and that thou hast justified thy sisters. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them, that thou mayest bear thine own shame, and mayest be confounded in all that thou hast done, and that thou art a comfort unto them. When thy sisters, Sodom and her daughters, shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then thou and thy daughter shall return to your former, uh, former estate. For thy sister Sodom was not mentioned by thy mouth in the day of thy pride. You know, it's all about their pride. You know, as we watch this pride parade, you know, coming down the streets of Cincinnati pretty soon. I don't know when it is. I don't want to look up all that filth. The Bible says, keep ye from all appearance of evil. I don't even want to look at none of that stuff. But I know it's coming. In Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 10 it says, This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. When it says they're implacable, you know, they come into these churches and they're not happy just to sit in church. They want to be behind the pulpit. They want to be deacons. They want to be children's workers. Uh, they want to be Sunday school teachers. That's what their goal is. When they magnify themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts, they're not going to be happy uh, ever. But they're not especially going to be happy until they're in the churches, uh, in the, the house of God. You know, and these wicked pastors that are effeminate, saying, oh, I just love everybody. Nobody's a sinner. Jesus loves everybody no matter what. Bringing all these, uh, you know, filthy homos into their church. Uh, what are they doing to their kids? They're saying, it's okay. We accept this. This is tolerant. You know, this is the way the world's going, so we're just going to go right along with it. Uh, we need to reach them, so let's bring them into the church. You know, that's wickedness. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, for I am holy. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 11, it says, In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then will I take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride. And thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. If you're there in Jude, the Bible is warning us here what it's going to be like in the last days before Jesus comes back. That's what the book of Jude is and the book of Revelation. But this is what it's going to be like. In verse number 7 it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That's what we're leading to today. We have lost our virtue, especially as Christians. You know, the world has never had really virtue. It's had some high standards that have all faded away. But we have lost our virtue as a nation, as a church nation. We have lost our virtue because of tolerance, acceptance. People are accepting this stuff. They're not rebuking it in the gate. They're not telling the world that, hey, this, <coughs> this is wrong. This is wickedness. 
God's going to destroy us with fire one day. As an example, he gave us the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what that example means. Uh, today, you know, the way our world's going, God is going to burn this up because of the wickedness like it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the last phase of wickedness is what I'm getting at. The last phase of wickedness. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were wicked, but they got more wicked and more wicked, and their cries were going up to God. Their wickedness, he just burned them. He didn't, he didn't give them no chance. It's the last phase. It doesn't get more wicked than that. You know, there's been many pastors over the years and saints in the churches that said that's the worst curse anybody could get in their lifetime. Worse than death, worse than any disease. It's the curse of Romans chapter 1 when God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. You know, that's the worst thing that could happen to a person. Filthy. I don't know of anything worse, you know. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather have some kind of terminal disease than to have that filth in my mind. Uh, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. You know, that's the worst thing that could happen to somebody. If you would go to Revelation chapter 22, our last verse, Revelation chapter 22. Last chapter in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. You know, it says, let him be filthy. That's no virtue. You know, us who are holy and righteous, we have virtue because we have a high moral standard that we need to express to the rest of the world. Uh, I know I'm beating a dead horse here and preaching to the choir, uh, but maybe somebody will see this on the Internet and, and uh, you know, realize what's coming in the world and how we need to have virtue, which is a high moral standard in our lives as Christians and not put up with this filth. You know, if the people who are rejecting Bud Light right now, would reject the rest of this garbage that's going on here, the world may change and say, hey, we need to quit this wickedness. You know, if people would vote uh, for people who are more godly, you know, maybe this stuff wouldn't be happening, but people are tolerant. You know, it's just give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Uh, that's what they want. They don't care if they have to give up their moral values to get what they want. You know, I'd rather get rid of all the things that I want to have a country that has high moral values and I would not have to worry about my kid's future. You know, when I'm gone, what the world is going to be like? How if, uh, you know, they don't accept this wickedness, uh, that they're going to be persecuted uh, and thrown out into the, you know, who knows what is coming in the future. You know, if, if the, the same people that are rejecting, you know, Bud Light and Tractor Supply and all these places for, for doing something so outlandish, you know, if they would reject all of it, you know, we'd have a better country. You know, it's, it's the Bud Light drinkers that are rejecting the wickedness. Isn't that amazing? It's not the church. You know, the church needs to speak up and say, hey, you know, this is all wickedness and we're not going to put up with it. You know, we're not going to vote for you politicians that are putting, and, you know, Trump is the worst one. You know, he's the one that is putting these people out as our ambassadors to other countries. He uh, says, I'm the best friend uh, the LGBTQ have ever had. He's probably right. You know, he's way better than Biden, but, uh, you know, because Biden's just uh, an idiot. But uh, he's just as wicked when it comes to, you know, the things that pertain unto God. He has no virtues or no high moral standards. Letting those things... Uh, come into our, our country and being a, a friend to uh, the haters of God, the wicked people. It says, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You know, that's virtue. You know, when we have virtue, we're going to have virtue in heaven. If we don't have no standards here on earth, are we going to have standards in heaven? Nah. You know, we're going to be made clean. Uh, but it says right there, let him which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. 
We should be righteous, have virtue, a high moral standard, especially as Christians, and let the world know that we're not going to put up with this filth that's going on. You know, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, your word today. 